In 17th century Britain, times were tough, to say the least. The effects of the Thirty Years' of War that raged in Europe were sorely felt, where many communities were plunged into poverty, famine and sickness. Then of course there was the English Civil War of 1642, that would last over 10 years between royalists and the parliamentarians, and would see a near complete desolation of regular authority throughout the land. How the country was meant to be governed was a hot debate, and the issue of how religion was meant to play out in this governing only made the matter more tense. The Catholics were losing their well-established hold on the nation, and the rise of the Protestants only complicated the political structure of the nation. In short, England was a messy place to be in, and with the legal system collapsing under the weight of all of this, it made for a breeding ground of dismay, turmoil and utter chaos. A throw witchcraft in there and you had yourself a recipe for utter disaster. It was bad enough that people were superstitious already. Witchcraft had already raged across Europe, and thanks to the superstitions of King James, who really knuckled down on the supposed threat of witches, people were surely looking for more tangible forms of protection, as opposed to just praying. Rumours of demonic forces and devious entities lurking in the night only made communities more and more paranoid, and so it is no wonder that in a time where people didn't really know any better, measures to curb witchcraft were sought out. In a time where many societies felt helpless to the goings on around them, from the civil unrest to the collapse of systems, there was one problem they could certainly solve. Their thinking was simple, to catch a witch, you called a witch hunter. And so enters Matthew Hopkins, an unremarkable man who history can tell us very little of. While most men of the 1600s took up a career in local agriculture, or smithies, craftsmen, tailors, weavers, clerks, lawyers, or even doctors to name a few, Matthew Hopkins decided that his calling lied not in honest blue collar work, but in something far more insidious. Whilst he would become to be known as a witch hunter, he preferred a far more grandiose title of Witch Finder General, a title he claimed was an official title bestowed upon him by the government, but in actuality was just something he made up because, let's face it, he thought it sounded way cooler. His career began in 1644 and, funnily enough, ended only a few short years later in 1647. He and his witch hunting buddies, some of which were women themselves, were responsible for the hanging of more supposed witches than in the previous 100 years. In fact, between the two years of his operations, he was responsible for over 300 executions of alleged witches. To put that in perspective, there were a total of nearly 500 witchcraft related executions in England between the 15th and 18th centuries. Therefore, Hopkins and his associates alone are responsible for around 60% of these deaths. Another way to look at this is that during Hopkins's two year crusade, he sent more witches to the gallows than all other witch hunters in England for the previous 160 years. But who was this avid witch hunter? And was he as much of a sociopath as he seems? Or was he just doing God's work, in a rather overzealous manner, by curbing the heresy in ways the church could not? Or better yet, was he just a fraud, who understood that the women he was condemning were innocent, but that he could also make a pretty penny in determining their fate? As mentioned, Matthew Hopkins appeared to have lived a rather unremarkable life prior to his witch hunting days. His life is shrouded in obscurity and myth, but what we can gather points to him leading a normal life, at least in his early years. He was born in the county of Suffolk in England around 1620 and was the fourth child of six. His parents were devout Puritans and his father, James Hopkins, was even the minister of a church. His family appeared to be somewhat well off, given that they had ties to shipping companies and that Matthew was educated in both English and Latin. Other sources believe that Matthew was trained as a lawyer, particularly given the manner in which he prosecuted witches during these trials, but there is no evidence of him having ever studied law. By his early twenties, Matthew Hopkins had a vision and a plan. 
which is more than most people had during this time of the mid-1640s. The English Civil War was well underway, the economy was in the toilet, and even production of food had taken a hit because of poor weather conditions. Fear and dismay crept into every crevice of the English landscape, which ironically made for the perfect stage for Matthew Hopkins to emerge. It was in 1644 when Matthew Hopkins met a man named John Stern after having moved to Manningtree in Essex. Even less is known about Stern other than that he was as much a Puritan as Hopkins was and that the two got on swimmingly. Their faith, however, was not the only thing they had in common. Despite being an older gentleman than the relatively young Hopkins, who was in his early 20s now, both men detested witches and sought to expose them. In his book, The Discovery of Witches, Hopkins tells us that the first time he encountered witches in the flesh was in his own town of Manningtree, and that he actually didn't have to travel too far to find them. He tells us that in March 1644, he found seven or eight witches who, every six weeks, would meet near his house on a Friday night. There he would see them make offerings to the devil, and would actually claim he saw one talking to an imp. At this, he tells us that he gatecrashed the ceremony and apprehended the witches, where he and Stern stripped the women and found upon them the marks of the beast, or the marks of the devil. In witchcraft trial history, the mark of the devil was thought to be a spot on the body which identified the person as a servant of Satan. Of course, looking back, these were usually just skin blemishes, liver spots, or in some cases, a third nipple. In this instance, one of the women who were apprehended and strip searched by Hopkins and Stern happened to have a third nipple, which Hopkins remarked, honest women did not have. Therefore, it had to have been an indication that the woman was evil that she was a witch, and that she served the devil, for he had marked her. Her name was thought to have been Elizabeth Clark, a poor old woman who actually only had one leg. Despite having claimed in his book to having seen her at a sacrificial gathering, and to interacting with an imp, the only evidence Hopkins and Stern could produce was the fact that she had a third nipple. To the courts at the time though, this was damning enough, and Elizabeth was placed in jail. It would set a precedent for witch hunters, in that for the most part, all they had to do was find an irregularity on the woman's body, and that more often than not, the courts would side with them, at least enough to detain the woman in question. Beyond that, the witch hunters would then need to get a confession out of the woman, and given that torture was an illegal practice, the witch hunters couldn't go about beating a confession out of their prisoners, although it didn't really stop them. You see, it turns out, there were few sympathisers for these women, who were accused of witchcraft. No one really cared if they were tortured, and to be honest, most people were probably happy for it to happen. And given how the authorities were inundated with work from the Civil War, it's probable that they were keen to turn a blind eye to the odd woman being tortured for a confession. To them, it probably didn't have so much significance in the grand scheme of things, and so the protection of alleged witches was the last thing on anyone's mind especially given how unpopular they were. With this in mind, Hopkins and Stern were pretty much allowed to push the boundaries when it came to their methods of extracting confessions from witches. In the case of Elizabeth, they were said to keep her in a cell, and each time she was about to fall asleep, they would wake her and march her around. It would be a technique they would enforce on many of their captives, denying them sleep and pushing them to both physical and mental exhaustion to the point that anyone would confess to being a witch out of sheer fatigue. In his book, Hopkins would justify this particular form of torture by saying that familiars, demons which served witches and took the form of animals, would only visit the witches when they were awake. Therefore, by keeping them awake, he could ensure an encounter with their respective familiars, something Hopkins claimed happened many times. In this sleep-deprived state, you can imagine how easy it would be to get someone to agree to anything. All it took after all was a meagre nod, and just like that, the exhausted prisoner would be condemned, usually to death. By the fourth night of her imprisonment, Elizabeth Clark conceded and admitted to having contact with five animal familiars. These included some interesting creatures, such as a white kitten by the name of Holt, 
a round dog named Jamara, two rabbits named Sack and Sugar, a cat named Newis, and a greyhound with the head of an ox that went by the name Vinegar Tom. Hopkins declared that these creatures and these names were so incredibly unethical that no mortal could have possibly made them up. Therefore, these creatures that Elizabeth Clark spoke of had to have been real, and therefore she had to have been a witch. I mean, you could see that the woman had lost inspiration pretty quickly, given that she'd named the rabbits Sack and Sugar, like she wasn't even trying to make it sound mystical or intriguing. But to Hopkins, who you might say didn't have much of a creative flair himself, decided that this was way too weird to not be witchcraft, and was therefore a total admission of Elizabeth's guilt. Elizabeth would also implicate several other witches from her town, and this would see Hopkins and Stern kept busy for the next few months. It suddenly seemed like there were more witches than Hopkins originally thought, and so with Stern, they expanded their team and even hired a group of women, who some might refer to as prickers, or something a little more eloquent. This witch hunting team scoured the area of Manningtree and interviewed, or interrogated more like, over a hundred people who were either accused by others or suspected of working for the devil. 32 of the people questioned were found guilty under the same conditions as Elizabeth Clark, in that they had familiars or marks of the devil, or had been kept awake long enough that they openly said so. It would become known as the Kelmsford Trials, and in July 1645, 32 people, most of them women, were convicted and either imprisoned or hanged. Of these 32 people, one Elizabeth Gooding was thought to have never confessed. Despite being kept awake for an unknown amount of days, she maintained her resolve and did not give Hopkins the answers he wanted. By now, word of Hopkins' ability to find witches was growing fast and wide. He declared himself the Witch Finder General, an official, unofficial title, that he seemed to have brandished himself. In any case, it worked wonders for him, because soon, other towns and communities were beckoning for his services. Hopkins was all but happy to oblige, of course, for a fee. As you can imagine, hiring Hopkins wasn't a cheap affair. In fact, there are cases where his fees became so ridiculous that taxes in certain areas had to be raised in order to afford him. But in order to justify his work, Hopkins was eager to give the people of these towns their money's worth, and this would lead him to start conducting more public interrogations. One of these interrogations involved swimming, which would see an accused witch dunked into a stream. There they were tied with rope, and sometimes made to hold large compendiums of the Bible. Once in the water, it was determined that if the witch began to drown, then they were innocent, but if they floated, because, you know, they could swim, then it was determined that they were a witch, and that in some roundabout way, Satan had saved them. The other idea was that because they had renounced their faith as witches, they had also negated their baptisms, and so, water now repelled them. You'd be relieved to know that the courts never took this form of interrogation seriously, but the townsfolk sure enjoyed the event and found it to be an example of Hopkins' thorough and totally legit services. The second method often used by Hopkins and Stern goes back to these prickers we mentioned earlier, these women who the two men had employed. Their role was exactly what it sounds like. Using semi-sharp or blunt objects, they would prick at the victim's body, and should the victim not bleed or feel no pain, then Hopkins determined that they had located a concealed devil's mark on their body. Hopkins and his band of witch hunters were relentless in their quest to condemn witches. They worked around the clock to round up covens, and even infiltrated various social groups, in order to drum up grievances and conspire with locals to get certain people incriminated. They would delve into the town's gossip and perpetuate the power of witches, causing more and more people to point the finger at each other. As you can imagine, what ended up happening was people started accusing their rivals, or people they didn't like, in the hopes that Matthew Hopkins, the witch finder general, would take them away. More often than not, he did. Most of the witches that Hopkins took from these towns were indeed those who were shunned by society, including the elderly, 
widows, poor people, the homeless, and women who had turned down bitter suitors. Whilst many may have seen Hopkins' work as a grim necessity, there were those who were suspicious of his actual abilities. I mean, after stacking over 200 witches into prisons across England in just a few short months, sooner or later, someone was going to start asking questions. I mean, having that many prisoners was a problem in itself, because the prisons could not afford to keep them very long, given the circumstances of the Civil War. In fact, in some cases, barns were repurposed in some towns to serve as prisons, so that Hopkins and his team had ample space to store those he deemed as witches. Hopkins went after another witch in one of his more famous captures, this time a male witch by the name John Lowe's, who happened to be a reverend in Bury St. Edmunds. Despite being an 80-year-old man, the reverend was said to be quite vocal, and would often be up everyone's ass to be more God-fearing and be more saintly. So the town grew sick of him, and accused him of witchcraft, hoping that Hopkins would take him away, and spare them of his sanctimonious ramblings. Hopkins found something like a nipple on the reverend's head, and two suspiciously shaped lumps under his tongue, which of course, he determined, were marks of the devil. Much to the enjoyment of the town, he also dunked the reverend in a moat, and given the reverend could swim, and didn't drown, he was considered by Hopkins to definitely be a witch. Under further interrogation, he admitted to having six imp creatures that served him, and that he had killed 14 men by cursing a ship to sink. Though this confession was later retracted. Despite this, he was still hanged, along with 17 others from the local area. But whilst the town might have been relieved that the reverend was gone, the fact that he was paraded about like an animal by Hopkins did raise some concerns, along with the fact that so many others had been killed under Hopkins' command, for seemingly little evidence other than a few marks. This was even more of a concern given that prisoners, like in the case of the Reverend, were retracting their statements as soon as the torture was over, which caused some suspicion over the severity of Hopkins' methods. Pretty soon, the press was speaking out against Hopkins' torturous methods, and before long, the interrogations that involved swimming were banned. Noticing the growing angst towards him, Hopkins began to distance himself from some of the bold claims he had previously made, some of which included that he had stolen Satan's Book of Witches, and that he knew the names of every witch in England. The death of Reverend John Lowe's would be something of a catalyst for the downfall of Hopkins. I suppose there may be some irony here, in that Hopkins's crimes against humanity had gone virtually unpunished, until he condemned a holy man to death. Had Hopkins angered his own god with this act, or was the very public killing of a holy man just a step too far for the people of the 17th century? For another reverend by the name of John Gall of Great Staunton, it most certainly was. He began to preach about Hopkins' actions, and condemn them as despicable. He even began to associate Hopkins' work with the purest forms of evil, and supplied the sentiment that if anyone was working for the devil, then it was Hopkins himself. He spoke endlessly of Reverend Lowe's innocence after his death, and sought to prove his innocence by collecting evidence of Hopkins' torture methods. It would even lead him to write a book about it, titled Select Cases of Conscious Touching Witches and Witchcraft, which totally rolls off the tongue, where he questions the actual existence of the imps and familiars that Hopkins spoke so boldly about. Interestingly, Gould also recognised the pattern of which types of people were condemned as witches, usually the elderly or women, those that were of course not in the position to resist the claims being put against them. He wrote, Every old woman with a wrinkled face, a furrowed brow, a hairy lip, a robber tooth, a squinty eye, a squeaking voice or scolding tongue, having a rugged coat on her back, a skull cap on her head, a spindle in her hand, and a dog or cat by her side, is not only suspect, but pronounced for a witch. By this point, Hopkins was vilified by the very same communities that he had claimed to have saved. Having left these towns as something of a hero, he was now shunned by them for his horrific torture methods and fraudulent nature. 
After having started witch hunting a mere two years prior, he retired to Manningtree, and I would imagine, kept as low profile as he possibly could. He didn't need to worry too much about that though, because in 1647, just a few months after his retirement, he died in his home from tuberculosis at the age of 27, where he was buried the same day. Whilst this is the most accepted version of his fate, there does exist another legend that after having been ousted for his ill treatment of his prisoners, and after having conned many of the towns out of their money, he was taken from his home and subjected to his own methods of torture. It's said that he was tied with a rope and thrown into a lake, but when he emerged from the waters on the account that he was able to swim, he was condemned as a witch and subsequently hanged. Matthew Hopkins was a product of his time, a time where there was a void in society itself, a time where law enforcement was lacking and morality was an even more flexible thing. People were suffering from not just the stress of the political state of the nation, but also poverty, sickness and general unrest. It was a time where no one flourished, the skies were grey, the lands were barren, and those that were religious may have been forgiven for thinking that their god had forsaken the land. In short, people were looking for answers, and in this great time of need, witchcraft became a part of that answer. With a man like Matthew Hopkins, the people had a means to tackle witchcraft, not because they wanted to see women hanged in the streets, but so they could fix their own lives and bring some balance to the hard times. But there was only so much relief that a witch hunter could bring, given that witchcraft was never actually the problem, so it comes as no surprise that the people began to engineer their own relief by implicating their enemies as witches. You only have to look at the vast majority of those who were accused to know that they were victims of personal grudges. The people of these communities may not have been able to feed their families, cure their illnesses, or even ensure their livelihoods, but with men like Matthew Hopkins in their reach, they could make their lives a little easier by ridding themselves of those that they hated. It was in this grim, desolate and acrimonious time that made the perfect conditions for a man like Matthew Hopkins to thrive. But did Hopkins really have it in for witches, or was he persecuting them so as to line his own pockets? Perhaps you might say that Hopkins was doing God's work, and that he was something of a zealot against heresy, or maybe just a zealot for money. Do you think it's right for him to shoulder all of the blame, given that he was hired by various communities to do this very work? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and as always, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe. Until the next time.